tuned in to the Andrew Lawton Show. Uh, my friend Dahlia Kurtz, I actually met in Israel for the first time in person. She and I were uh, colleagues for the same radio company some years ago, and we had the chance to go and travel Israel as part of a delegation of Canadian journalists and have been uh, friends ever since. Uh, Dahlia was working on a book about something that had nothing to do with politics, nothing to do with Israel, but was pushed off of that project onto another one in the wake of October 7th. That book is called Dear Zionist, You Are Not Alone, just came out in the last few days. And, and Dahlia joins me on the line now. Dahlia, wonderful to talk to you again. Thank you so much for coming today. What's the background? What is happening here? I, did, I thought you did that. I do, I do not. None. No background. That was... <laughs> there we there we go. We're, we're off to a great start. It was the laser from Zion. They redirected it in the inappropriate way. They were supposed to use those lasers to send them... I'm not allowed to say. Andrew, I'm so happy to be on your show. <laughs> well, it's good to have you here. I, I, let me... Just start. Let's start on that comment by Christian Freeland because you have always been, and even just now, we're talking about a serious topic. But you've always been just this ray of sunshine in Canadian media. But back when you did your your uh, former show, I know you always used to highlight good news stories and positive things. I, I've seen from you a lot more of an edge since October seventh, and I, I don't fault you for that. But I, I was wondering if you could speak about how what's happened has really pushed the way that you are using your voice. Well, one. When you're an independent, things change. People don't have to tell you to not be as Jewish. You could be Jewish, but not a Jew. Ish part is okay. But the other part of it is October 7th, I, I just put everything aside. I dropped everything that I was doing because I immediately saw where this was going and what this was going to become. And I immediately realized I'm going to be that person that I always thought I would be if something like this happens again. And let me tell you, anybody who is a child of the Holocaust, a grandchild of the Holocaust, that's what you're, you're going to think. It's going to be in the back of your brain forever. To hear Christia Friedland speak the way that she does, I mean, the entire thing was absolutely laughable. So all I can do is I... I wrote an entire joke about it online, but the sad part is it, it was funny, but it was only funny because it's true. So it's actually entirely pathetic. I wasn't in Ottawa. I had heard what had happened. You don't need to be in Ottawa. She could have asked any one of the hundred plus people in that room, like you said, to just play a little clip of the audio there. She which she, of course, let's all be clear, she already heard that audio. There's no way that she never did. And then she has to plop in there somewhere. Let me just say, Islamophobia is yeah. on the rise in Canada, which she forgot to mention in that whole little spiel is about her sweet grandfather, who, interesting connection when, you know, he is one of the Nazi newspapers that recruits Hmm, who did we end up seeing in our parliament? It was the same type of person. There's a lot of direct lines here. So, you know, it's not her action that I'm looking at. It's her inaction. And the inaction is abundantly clear. There was a mosque that had a break in entry. It was an attempted break in entry in Winnipeg a couple of weeks back. Justin Trudeau drops everything. Carbon emissions be damned. And he gets himself to Winnipeg. You could see like this lock was sort of broken. And he's hand on heart hand on heart. Nobody should be scared of a place they worship in. What about the hundred churches that have gone up yeah. in flames? What about the Jews who 400,000 of us with numbers dwindling as we're moving away, making Aliyah more and more? What about that? What does that mean to him? And it's come to a point where the way I feel about it is everybody keeps saying lead, lead. And I mean, just yesterday I shared some investigative journalism that I've done where I looked at the person who had been campaigning for the mayor of Toronto, Olivia Chow. And this person, Mozen Patel, I have a video in this tweet where you can see him asking, demanding that we kill Israel, the very person who has been campaigning with Olivia Chow. So you know what? I think it is absolutely ridiculous that we even ask the leaders to do better. There's there's nothing to do better because one, 
they're leaders with air quotes. And two, they've already failed us. So we see what they're capable of and we see what they're not capable of. So the leaders have failed us. We will not fail us. And I feel that that it's up to me. It's up to people who have a voice. It's up to anybody who will speak up and not be afraid. Andrew, it boggles my mind that people call me outspoken. Why? Because I say, don't kill the Jews. Crazy talk. You said something a few moments ago I, I wanted to revisit because you, you said it, I, I think, almost incidentally, but you had said the type of person, you wanted to be the type of person you thought you'd be if something like this happened again. And I found that word again quite jarring because you and I know that terrorism in, in Israel is not sadly uncommon. I mean, when you and I were there in 2015, there had been a, a spate of knife stabbings on the street and Israelis have a, a much higher than normal tolerance level for you know these sorts of, of things there. It takes a lot for something to rise to front page news in Israel that elsewhere in the world would be. But when you say never again, you're, you're putting October 7th, as I understand it, in the same category as the Holocaust, are you not? A hundred percent. And that's not even coming from my mouth directly. That's coming from every hostage who's been released. They have said that was a Holocaust. It's, mm. it's a Holocaust. And so I'm going to take from the people who were there, I'm going to take from the feeling that it gave me. And that is absolutely a Holocaust. I, I shared a picture the other day. I was looking at Columbia University and all of the students there who are blocking the Jews from going in. And I juxtaposed that against a picture I saw from 1938 in Vienna, where the students were blocking the Jewish students from entering. And I thought, I'm going to find obviously the similarities in this. But what really struck me were not the similarities. It was the dark differences. It was the fact that now in 2024, where it looked worse because you saw more students, population has grown this or that. The worst part about it is that these students who are now joining in this Kristallnacht, as it was described by the Jewish students at Columbia, they've had the opportunity to see history. They've had the opportunity to learn from history mm -hmm. and they have chosen the side of be less than human from history. So that choice unto itself makes this much worse than what we experienced before. And to see the way that Canada has reacted, to see what's happening in the US, to see all of these governments fail us, I can completely understand how you create bonds and you create bonds with people. It's the entire bond of Am Yisrael Chai. You know, it's the bond of being one because you know that not everybody is going to have your back. So if they don't have it, you will have it. But at the same time, there are a bunch of people who are suffering and not everybody has the tools to cope with this. And since October 7th, I've been receiving messages because I've been very bold and I have been blacklisted up the wazoo, Andrew. Death threats, blacklisted. My entire mission has just gone to, okay, fine. I'm just going to pour myself into this. You can't pay rent with pouring yourself into something. I'll be clear about that. But I will pour myself into this. And if people are sending me messages from around the world saying that I'm doing something that's helping them, well, that's absolutely fantastic. I need to do more of this. So I decided to write this book, Dear Zionist, You Are Not Alone, 18 Letters of Hope and Light. And the whole idea of it, first of all, is that this is not about Jews. It's about Jews and our non-Jew supporters. The quickest Zionist test anybody could take, and most people don't even realize that they're a Zionist, but the quickest Zionist test anybody could take is, do you believe Israel has a right to exist? And if you say yes, Mazel Tov, you're a Zionist. And, you know, I got a message from one of the readers yesterday, and she said to me, I finished reading the book, and, you know, this part about you are not alone when we're getting to that. I know that you meant it for Jewish people, but I have to say, it really made me feel not alone. I, I didn't mean it for Jewish people. I meant it for people. I meant it for anybody who has a shred of humanity in them, because I can guarantee you, you can be any religion, any color, any heritage, any ethnicity, and 
this book is going to touch you in some way. Just be careful who you sit next to on an airplane because one of the readers was crying next to somebody who did not quite know mm. how to comfort them through this. I, uh, let me ask you about the hopefulness of it because one of the challenges in a, in a time like this is that we don't yet see an end in sight. I mean, if anything, you know, the public sympathy for Israel from people that might not identify as Zionist was at a high point on October 7th, October 8th. And I think it's been in decline ever since then. And I, I think, you know, people often very dishonestly conflate, you know, oh, I have this little criticism with Benjamin Netanyahu. Uh, they, they use that to sort of shield, no, you actually have a deep hatred of, of the Jewish people. You're just, you know, trying You're to- You're synagogue in Toronto and Benjamin Netanyahu's in his war cabinet. Yes. Yeah, yeah, he, he doesn't even, you know, know what Young Street is and and you're you're out there and you're in, uh, you know, Forest Hill and all of that. Uh, but, but where do you see this going? Because, you know, with any sort of, you know, boiling crisis like this, the, the fear is that it has to get worse before it gets better. But but at this point, it is worse. I mean, we're seeing this. We're seeing open calls for violence on the street. And at, at this point, people are faced with two options. They can either do something about it, or they can literally do the Christian Freeland thing, do the ostrich thing, stick your head in the sand and say, oh, I wasn't in Ottawa. Like like at that point, it, it's you you can't make it more apparent than these people already have. The hiding thing isn't hiding, it's aiding and abetting. That's all it is. I, I don't see any other way around it. I think that things, especially this past weekend, I saw the surge and I see the surge of violence that's going to get worse. Somebody in person, in person. I mean, Andrew, I get death threats. I get people have like measured nooses for my neck. I, I've had so many horrid things said to me online, but there was a person just near where I live, who saw me, gave me a dirty look and called me a Nazi. Quick to run, mind you, because that's what they do. Let's- I, I love how defending Jews has become Nazism in uh, 2024. Yeah. I mean, this that's shows like how devoid of historic, historic knowledge and just you know basic fundamental reason these people are. And I took the word Zionist also for the book because one, its meaning is powerful and true, and two, they're trying to take the word Zionist away from us. This has been an ongoing campaign, and this is where the Jewish people have failed themselves in fighting something like this, which we've known for many, many years has been coming. There has been an ongoing Palestinian pa pa campaign that is very centralized, and everybody has their documents, and everybody has their way of speaking, and there's a very clear path, and it is being executed exceptionally well. It is a very well-oiled machine. Meanwhile, you have so many different Jewish organizations, each trying their own thing, not necessarily working together. And it's just ending up being a lot of noise instead of cohesiveness. So this entire idea of the war that is not in the field, but the war that the war that is in the real world, it needs to change the way that it is fought. And for me, I look at that in a couple of folds. One, you need to strengthen your people. And by my people, I'm not referring to Jewish people. I'm referring to Jewish people and our non-Jewish supporters. And I think that the strength that is found in this book from the people who have been at the most bitter, bitter points of darkness in their lives, the things that have happened to them, a few of them are Holocaust survivors. One is a war hero. Another was on his way to terrorist camp to become a terrorist, and then everything changed for him. So when you look at what these people have been through, and also a very special story about my father, because he did, uh, he sacrificed everything to change Canada so that people could get jobs regardless of religion, which ended up hurting him much more later on. But when you look at the hardships, the tragedies, the how are they going to get out of this, and these true stories, and not only how they made it through, but how they made it through to become exceptional successes who thrived beyond measure. And I will say, if you've ever seen Inglorious Bastards, the last person that I highlight as a Holocaust survivor in this book, Dr. Morris Schnitzer, it will give you a little bit of that cathartic kick that you could get. I'm not going to give anything away there, but really the whole point of this is, I think that's one side of the battle is 
helping people, empowering people, Jews and our non-Jewish supporters. And that is where this book comes from. And I have greater plans for a bigger series. I had to get this out as quick as possible. My second edition is going to be longer in audiobook, in paperback. And then this whole Dear Zionist is going to move on towards other series as well. But first, we have to work on strengthening people. And the other side is we have to become more cohesive. We have to create a more of a singular vision in how we're going to tackle this the same way that the PR on the other side has been working it for years, for years, for years, for years. And that requires a lot of catching up. But we've also learned from Israelis and Jewish people, we can be very innovative, especially when our lives are at risk. <laughs> Yeah, very much so. And I, I've always been, you know, well, I've always tremendously admired the resilience of, of Israelis, but you have to extend that to Jewish people now. And, you know, people that go around the world in this day and age and wear a yarmulke, walk into a synagogue, wear a Star of David. I mean, they're doing that knowing full well what that attracts. And there you go. You got the, uh, you got the, I don't know, it's a super, super Jew, Superman. I don't know. It's a little bit of both there. Super I Jim. love it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's, uh, Sean, throw that book cover up there. The, uh, the book from Dahlia Kurtz called Dear Zionist, You Are Not Alone. You can get that over on her website, DahliaKurtz.com. Great to talk to you, Dahlia. Thanks so much for coming on today. Andrew, can I just mention quickly? Of course. You, you bought this book from me. I didn't ask for this conversation. I'm happy I'm here. Usually you send media a book and, you know, that's just how it is. You didn't even ask me for a copy like everybody else. You paid, sir. Worth every penny. But I will say, I mean, I when I worked in, in daily radio, I, I used to, you probably did as well in Winnipeg. I'd get from publishers, like it was, it got to the point where it was almost like, um, you know, like the letters in Harry Potter and the, where they just keep coming, like all these books, like <laughs> books would just show up and I've never like asked for them or ordered them. And and then once I wrote a book for the first time, I I was like, no, I can't afford to just give everyone books. And now I always, I always support my friends by buying the books. So I want to know from the book at the end, you tell me your favorite quote, no pressure to read it. Okay, I'll do. Yeah, it's always you pick one from the middle so that everyone knows you read it and didn't just read it. <laughs> but I will read it from cover to cover. Uh, Dahlia, thank you so much. Thank you. Shalom. All right. Thanks for listening to the Andrew Lawton Show. Support the program by donating to True North at www.tnc.news.